In January of 2019, when Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard announced her candidacy for President of the United States of America, there was a mild celebration on the political left. After all, this is the woman who endorsed Senator Bernie Sanders back in 2016, suggesting to some that she shared many of his values and political positions. Anti-establishment Democrats and a smattering of leftists lauded her as the next big star of the party. But as time went on and those same Democrats learned more about her, support stagnated. There was no growth in her polling numbers, starting the year around 1% and ending the year around 1% as well, even with a less crowded field due to several high-profile dropouts. Yet even now that it is clear that she will not be the Democratic nominee, a handful of Democrats are still showing her support. Democrats vary, so this is no surprise, but what is surprising is whenever a bona fide leftist supports her, an anti-capitalist, an anti-imperialist, through a series of last-minute flip-flopping on the issues and a short-lived feud with Democratic establishment figurehead Hillary Clinton, Gabbard has given some on the left the mistaken impression that she should be counted among their numbers. Gabbard is not a leftist or even a Democratic socialist like Sanders. Her politics are a hand grenade, exploding all over the political spectrum, sometimes in very concerning places. Some on the left, or even some garden-variety disenfranchised Democrats, are so eager for a fresh new face or someone who seems outside the establishment that they are willing to support a candidate whose politics are all over the place and sometimes noticeably right-wing. Outside the establishment does not automatically mean to the left of the establishment. It only means outside. So few Democrats still support her that those who remain have become embedded, digging in their claws and denouncing any criticism of Gabbard as a smear, even when said criticism is a simple recounting of the facts like her voting record. It's not the lame stream media distorting her record, it's just her record, easily accessible through her public appearances, recorded interviews, history, and votes in the House of Representatives. It's not a smear if it's true. The reason Gabbard has so much negative attention, particularly for someone who has zero chance of actually winning the nomination, is because, in this case, she earned that negative attention. However, it's unhelpful to label all Gabbard supporters as cultists. Nobody is going to change their mind while being called that. So let's be charitable and assume that many Gabbard supporters and people for whom she is their second choice simply do not have all the facts. Different doesn't mean better. It only means different. And sometimes, it might be worse. Tulsi Gabbard has cultivated an image for herself of the anti-interventionist candidate. Gabbard goes on the debate stage and claims that U.S. interventionism is just the worst, and we shouldn't be staging coups and getting involved in regime change. This caught the eye of anti-imperialist progressives and leftists. The problem with her statement is that it does not align with her record and her reality. Gabbard supports the global war on terror, enacted by President George W. Bush and continued by both U.S. presidents since then. On the conflicts, she has called herself a hawk. Her words. The attack on U.S. soil so many years ago provided an opportunity and pretext to finally implement long-standing plans to have greater access to Middle East oil reserves, particularly in Iraq, a central component of the Persian Gulf resources. The U.S. and its allies are demonstrably not spreading democracy. Any marginal progress following regime change in the region is incidental. The U.S. is there to consolidate its control over the region's resources, particularly oil. These conflicts are a matter of interests, not democracy. Regime change, the thing that Tulsi Gabbard claims to despise, inevitably happens. Following the events of New York and Washington, D.C., the U.S. could engage in these wars for resources more freely than before, and there is no greater supporter of these conflicts, these regime changes, these interventions, than Tulsi Gabbard. Her service in Iraq, seeing imperialism in action, civilian losses, and extrajudicial slaughter only strengthened her resolve. Even though these conflicts escalated even further under President Barack Obama, Gabbard was still unsatisfied with Obama because he didn't say the phrase radical Islam enough for her liking. She went on Fox News, where they love her by the way, and denounced the president for not saying that phrase. 
Republican politicians feed on that nationalism, that xenophobia, among their voters. Gabbard loves saying that phrase personally, but also wants everyone to say it. From the president to the newspapers. I wonder why that is. Gabbard touts her anti-interventionist credentials, while at the same time supporting the myriad global conflicts that result in catastrophic loss of life and exist predominantly for U.S. control of resources in the Middle East. Gabbard can support the bombings and civilian losses in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and her supporters don't say a word. But if she says she does not support interventionism in Bolivia, then her supporters rise up and call her the candidate of peace. Gabbard is an interventionist. One can't claim someone is an anti-interventionist while supporting U.S. interventionism, regime change, and an escalation of conflicts across the globe. It is ludicrous. Gabbard publicly draws a distinction between regime change in Iraq and regime change in Bolivia, but the facts don't support that. Now, it's important to note that since the George W. Bush administration, Democratic politicians in general have become a lot more hawkish. Nearly all of them, in one form or another, support these conflicts or at least pay lip service to them in public. It's all a matter of degrees. But it's important to note Gabbard's support for two reasons. One, it exposes her alleged anti-interventionism as demonstrably false and part of her branding and image. Two, how hawkish Democrats are is still a matter of degrees, and her foreign policy specifically is full of right-wing talking points and bizarre positions and actions. Here are some examples. Following the election of Donald Trump, Steve Bannon called Gabbard and asked her to meet with Trump at Trump Tower, and she accepted. The Hill reported that Bannon loves Tulsi Gabbard and that he views her as someone who is aligned with Trump on foreign policy. In early 2017, Tulsi Gabbard quietly took a fact-finding trip to Syria, unbeknownst to Congress. Gabbard talked to university students in Damascus, assuring them that she wanted to stop the U.S. from supporting what she called terrorist groups, but are actually any rebels opposed to the Assad regime. Not just actual terrorist groups. There are terrorist groups there, but she seems to label all rebels as terrorists. According to The New Yorker, she conveyed the impression that rebels brought chaos to Syria and that the only path to peace was to put down the revolution. This insurrection is largely against the regime of President Bashar al-Assad, a despicable war criminal who kills his own people. Assad has used indiscriminate bombardments, destroying homes, medical facilities, schools, electrical facilities, bakeries, and crops. He dropped barrel bombs on defenseless civilians, killing at least 68,000 since 2012, according to one count. Not to mention shells and cluster bombs. Assad used chemical weapons to kill up to 70 people in rebel-held Doma in April of 2017. Assad used sarin gas to kill around 100 people in rebel-held Khan Shikhan. Assad's troops opened fire during protests at the start of the Syrian uprising in March of 2011. This was long before Assad could claim that he was only doing this to stop violent insurrectionists. Assad tortured thousands of Syrians in his dungeons, many of whom ended up, let's say, disappeared. He starved the people of Medea, an opposition-held town near Damascus. Residents died of malnutrition and starvation according to Physicians for Human Rights. He bombed stateless Palestinians at the Yamark refugee camp in 2011, 2013, and 2014. The list goes on and on. Tulsi Gabbard met twice with Assad, who wanted to convince her of the threat posed by the rebels. Gabbard gave an interview in which she intimated that she and Assad, who is known to viciously punish dissent, had negotiated an agreement to bring democracy to Syria. That is not what happened. Following Gabbard's visit, Assad continued to commit atrocities in Syria. And when confronted with this, Gabbard went on record saying that she did not believe the reports and defended Assad. A joint investigation by the United Nations and the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons found unmistakable evidence that he did. Human Rights Watch and Hans Blix also agreed that Assad was to blame. But Tulsi Gabbard? Oh, she's skeptical. After all, she, a then inexperienced congresswoman, was assured that Assad wouldn't do that. So... How did Gabbard even get there? 
How did she end up meeting with Assad? This was not some official state visit. Well, it was eventually revealed that the trip was funded and coordinated by a pair of Lebanese-American businessmen with ties to a pro-Assad political party. In other words, the people funding her trip wanted her to go to Syria to make Assad look good. Gabbard's supporters defend her visit, claiming that she was there in the interest of peace. But her stance against the rebels, who she claims are all terrorists, is implicit support for their continued annihilation. Her supporters call her visit principled, except that it was funded by pro-Assad businessmen. Her supporters call her visit important for the peace process, except that it didn't work. Her supporters called her meeting with Assad merely a negotiation and not an explicit support for the brutal dictator, and that this is only guilt by association, except that she has consistently defended Assad. All the arguments in Gabbard's defense fall apart under scrutiny. She has doubled down on her meeting every time it has been brought up. A rogue congresswoman meeting with Assad is not a diplomatic mission. That's what ambassadors are for. Some oversight is necessary so not to upend ongoing work done by trained diplomats and to avoid diplomatic catastrophes, like this one. What else? Well, in an interview with Truthout, Gabbard said of drones, there is a place for the use of this technology, as well as smaller quick-strike special forces team. Drones have made these conflicts simpler to engage in, and they have also taken out thousands upon thousands of civilians. Gabbard has received a lot of applause from the right for opposing the Iran nuclear deal. The Obama administration may have continued much of the Bush administration's conflicts, but it at least recognized the value of diplomacy. Not Gabbard, however, who told her friends at Fox News that she was cynical toward the pact. Gabbard's position on refugees should be of some concern as well. She introduced a resolution in the House of Representatives calling for the United States to prioritize Christians when granting refugee status. She also joined the House Republicans in passing the SAFE Act in 2015, which added extra requirements to the already tremendously sluggish refugee vetting process. The SAFE Act did what it set out to do. It effectively ground to a halt the admission of refugees from Syria and Iraq, majority Muslim countries. In November of 2015, she traveled to Egypt as part of a congressional delegation and met Egyptian dictator Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Unlike her rogue trip to Syria, this was an official meeting, but her comments afterward were all her own. She said, President al-Sisi has shown great courage and leadership in taking on this extreme Islamist ideology. Some of al-Sisi's courageous actions include killing a group of Mexican tourists, torturing and killing an Italian PhD student, killing protesters by security forces, military trials of civilians, and the forced eviction of thousands of families in the Sinai Peninsula. But that's not all. Perhaps Gabbard's closest friend and ally in politics is India's Hindu nationalist Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Modi began his career as an activist with the RSS, a right-wing nationalist organization that stokes anti-Muslim sentiment in India. One of its members assassinated Gandhi over accusations of being too peaceful toward Muslims. Modi played a role in the 2002 anti-Muslim riots in India, which left roughly 1,000 people dead. A senior police officer testified in 2011 that the night before the riots, Modi said that the Muslims needed to be taught a lesson. Gabbard is Modi's biggest supporter in the U.S., saying, He is a leader whose example and dedication to the people he serves should be an inspiration to elected officials everywhere. She also called the 1,000 deaths and Modi's involvement misinformation and has played cover for Modi whenever possible. She even voted against a House resolution condemning India's religious violence. But there's even more. When asked about whether or not she supports torture, Gabbard refused to condemn it, stating that the jury's still out on torture. Years later, in preparation for her presidential campaign, she finally condemned the use of torture. But if anyone thinks it's a coincidence that she came to this conclusion around the same time she announced her candidacy, I have some magic beans to sell you. Next, Gabbard herself co-sponsored a House resolution designed to reaffirm the U.S.'s commitment to reflexively use its veto power in the United Nations to defend Israel's reputation when it bombs Palestinian civilians. 
She also co-sponsored a bill that condemns efforts to boycott Israel following these bombings, which puts her in line with the most hawkish lobby-backed members of the U.S. Congress. In public, Gabbard has claimed that she desires a Palestinian state, but this is contradicted by some of her votes and some of her affiliations. For example, in the two-year period spanning November 2014 to November 2016, Gabbard received $21,975 from anti-Palestinian groups, and in 2015 spoke at a conference for Christians United for Israel, a far-right organization that strongly opposes Palestinian statehood. She works with people who oppose Palestinian statehood. That's who she really is. Her rhetoric on the debate stage does not match her history, nor does it match her policies or voting record. Now, this is all just her foreign policy. In fairness, some of her domestic policy is fairly progressive, but that has been a recent development. Prior to adopting progressive policies, she was vehemently conservative on a number of issues. But okay, if we accept her domestic policies as sincere, most of what she wants is now pretty mainstream among Democratic voters. There is no reason to seek out Tulsi Gabbard as the stalwart for any domestic policy among the Democrats because she is not unique among the other candidates in that regard. Earlier this month, in anticipation of not qualifying for the latest Democratic debate, Gabbard claimed that that was her decision to not participate. Hopefully, nobody is naive enough to believe that if she had qualified, she would still say the same thing. This is the equivalent of, you can't fire me, I quit. And last but not least, Gabbard showed us exactly who she is by not voting for the impeachment of Donald Trump, the only Democrat to vote present instead of yay or nay. What is she protecting, besides a possible spot on Fox News? Regardless of whether you think the impeachment is a worthwhile endeavor or just state pageantry that gives only the illusion of accountability, by voting present, Gabbard made common cause with Donald Trump and strengthened the argument of the political right as we approach an election year. She's not on the left. Her statement following her present non-vote was, I am standing in the center. If you don't believe me, believe her. When someone shows you who they are, believe them. That's who she is. To sum up, Gabbard's foreign policy is either to the right of mainstream Democrats or in line with most mainstream Democrats, depending on the issue. Bringing up costly wars on the debate stage has made her the public face of the anti-war movement for some left-leaning Democrats, but her actual record on foreign policy is anything but... Her chosen public image as a maverick does not automatically make her left-wing. Gabbard's supporters say that everything said against her is a media smear. Okay, so... Sometimes the corporate media purposefully shifts the narrative to protect itself. That is true. Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have promised to drastically raise taxes on the super-rich, and gigantic media institutions have a vested interest in sabotaging their campaigns, particularly Sanders, who is the furthest to the left of any of the Democratic candidates. The Onion has joked about this in case you're looking for a good laugh and a deep, deep sigh. Corporate media went after Warren as well. They went after her hard once she became the co-frontrunner for a few weeks, and now she's plummeted in the polls down to number three as of this writing. However, Sanders and Warren are seen as threats to the corporate world. Gabbard is not. She has consistently polled at 1%. In addition to this, Gabbard announced that she won't be running for re-election in Congress now that she has raised her profile enough to be a high-paid public speaker, author, or cable news pundit, the ultimate goal of many also-ran candidates. So, with this in mind, corporate media isn't smearing her to keep her out of the White House. Not because corporate media isn't capable of it, but because she has never even come close to being a contender or a threat. What she is, however, is a frightening reminder of how a politician, not the media, can distort their own image and even fool some people who are comparatively more savvy about their politics than garden-variety Democratic voters who only pay attention to the world every four years. That's why I made this video, even though she has no chance and is about to drop out of politics altogether. 
because spreading left-wing ideals should be about that. Spreading left-wing ideals. Not supporting anyone who happens to be outside the establishment. Outside the establishment does not equal to the left of the establishment. It only means outside. In the case of Tulsi Gabbard, where she differs from most Democrats is how far to the right she is on foreign policy and how cozy she is with right-wing institutions like Fox News. And just for the record, I don't believe simply appearing on Fox News makes you right-wing. Sanders has appeared on Fox News and a few other people have appeared on Fox News, it's fine. But parroting Fox News talking points is different from just appearing on Fox News. Gabbard's supporters call anything leveled at her a smear or an attack. But this is just her record. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's her own words, her own voting record, and her own policies that she has stated herself. We all want something different, but Tulsi Gabbard ain't it, Chief. Or as a soldier, do you have a very different perspective on the use of torture? Um, very bluntly, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted on this report. There are, uh, I think the jury is still out on the report itself. Let's say in an hour, hmm. a nuclear bomb or an attack hmm. will go off unless this information is found. Uh, I believe that if I were the President of the United States, that I would do everything in my power to keep the American people safe.